to the session today. My name is David Coote. I'll be um, chairing the session as well as running some of the um, uh, uh, discussions that you can see on the screen there. So if you go through your app, go to the interactive area, you'll be able to interact with the speakers uh, electronically and I'll be moderating that and putting your comments up as we go. So, and feel free to do so. Um, and we encourage, at this session, apart from the, um, a few talks, will be fairly interactive and we have a, a unique group uh, of experts, uh, well respected, I reckon they all they have traveled the world and spoken at hundreds of conferences. So I uh, wouldn't be surprised this room will be standing room only by in about two minutes time. So still plenty of seats up the front for the people in the back. But I'll get started. First, our, our, so our first speaker is going to be, yeah, sorry. Okay, sure, sorry. No problem. I'm just going to wait 30 seconds as the video uh, being set up and the baby settles in. <coughs> Thank you. So, the first speaker today uh, in this session is going to be Wes Ely. Wes, um, yesterday probably most of you would heard his um, um, bio, and I can repeat it, but I'll take another 20 minutes. Um, so I will just say that Wes is obviously a, a world expert in ICU delirium. Um, he's worked over decades, along with the, the other speakers that we have today, is well renowned, and then I don't need to give you any more introduction about the size of the crowd of this room. Um, apart from that, he's also the warmest and nicest guy you ever meet, and if you have a chance to shake his hand, you know exactly what I mean. So, uh, you don't want to hear me speak, so I'll get Wes on the stage. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, and good morning. I hope everybody is having a great day. And I'm glad to see the baby here. I met the baby yesterday in the session at the back of the room. I hope that we're teaching the baby enough. My name is Wes Ely. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very thankful to be able to share some things with you. Yesterday I was very inspired by our coach, Dr. Ch speaker, for some of you who might not have been at the opening session, it was, it was a talk about leadership, <clears throat> about change, and about humility and honesty. And in my talk, I, I really focused on that humility and honesty piece. And as I was looking over the slides I created for this talk today, I really thought that they, were, they dovetailed nicely into this talk. And so I'm going to challenge you to do this during this talk. I'm going to challenge you to remember that whenever we really enact real change in our lives, if there's something that we actually have to change in our life, it's not something that we can pursue passively. And you could be thinking right now about diet, exercise, relationships, spiritual values, whatever it might be, where you're trying to tune up something in your life. And after yesterday's session, and then looking at these slides today, I was just thinking that the theme of this really is about active change and not passive change. And all too often when we go to a lecture or a meeting like this, we kind of sit in the chair and passively approach the situation. So I'm going to ask you to do this. Think, as I pursue my career here going forward, what is it that I actually need to change? What should I change about the way that I think when I approach the patient in the bed? And then let's just see if that helps us to do a better job today. Oops. So I'm going to dive in. Okay, I don't know how to get this started. Oh, click on your name. Click on my name. There we go. This is very complicated. Okay. So I'm going to talk about sedation and delirium. I'm going to try and finish up early in case there are Q&A. And if you think of some questions, don't be bashful. We will pursue them. I always start with any disclosures. I don't have stocks or consultancies with industry, but it is important at the fourth bullet there to note that Pfizer, who's sponsoring this, sponsored me to come here. I think these sponsorships are a gift because obviously some of us can't afford to travel this far, but having said that, I will refrain from doing anything other than peer-reviewed literature and evidence-based comments. So I'll restrict my comments to the evidence base, and if I deviate from that into anecdote, then you can put your hip waders on and we will qualify it. As, an, as a non-evidence-based comment. I decided to start with this quote from Abraham Heschel. This is a quote that was um, many decades old, 1964, and he said, medicine is more than a profession. It is not an occupation for those to whom career is more precious 
the humanity or for those who value comfort and serenity above service to others. And the reason I put this quote in there has to do with what I asked you about active change. You see, if you put yourself first, if I put myself first at the bedside, I can stay passive, I can stay the same, but if I actually think about the person in the bed, then I have to get rid of my own comfort. And what I'm going to talk about today, this change that it's required for us at the bedside, going from deep sedation, long mechanical ventilation, active uh, restraint use, immobilization, over to something quite different, well, you can't do it passively. There's just no way. This is the way we used to think about critical care. Somebody comes in, they're sick, even if they're young, we sedate them to hell in a handbasket, put them into the stone age, and they sit there until we think they're better, then we let them up. But what has been required over the past decade, because of the evidence I'm going to show you, is that we look at it differently. This is my daughter who's studying here in Perth. She is just down the road. I jogged over there this morning over past the yacht club where her dorm room is. And she's looking through prism glasses. She's studying engineering. She's trying to see things differently. And this is what we have to do. We have to see this care of the critically ill patient differently. We began seeing it differently in the past five years in dramatic fashion. This was the cohort study that we were sponsored by the NIH to do, the National Institute of Health. They gave us about $7 million to do this investigation called the Brain ICU. The first paper that came out from the Brain ICU was in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was entitled Long-Term Cognitive Impairment After Critical Illness. And what we did was we took 800 patients, all of whom were on mechanical ventilation and or in shock. So imagine that row of people, just think about the humanity of that, all on vents or on norepi, et cetera. And we watched them in a detailed fashion throughout their ICU stay and then over the next year. And now we actually have data out to six years. We haven't published the four and six year data yet, but I just submitted a paper this week on the four and six year data, one, one subgroup of them. But what we began to see differently in this cohort was that we brought them back or we drove to them. So we, uh, we had about an 80% follow up amongst survivors, which is a very good completion of a program in terms of compliance. And what we what we found was that, if you look at the right column, which is over the age of 65, was that the median cognitive function, shown by this dark bar here, and these are the interquartile ranges, is hovering right around these two lines at the bottom, the red and the uh, blue slash magenta line, which on the far left you can see stand for traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's disease. So these patients who only had, who the vast majority of whom had no cognitive impairment on the front end, in fact of these 800 patients, only 6% of them had any detected pre-existing cognitive impairment whatsoever. We excluded this because we wanted a fairly clean cohort. And yet on the back end of this ICU stay, we found that the majority of them had um, had a circumstance that would be commensurate with Alzheimer's disease and traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> now, I got into this cohort because I was so interested in geriatric aging and what's going on with the old people, but you can see on the far left, at the age, below the age of 65, that there was really no difference. And if you look one graph further and go all the way to the left, you can see, can you technically fix that? I don't know why it keeps going blank like that. Um, but on the, on the far left, I can do it without slides if, if required. But on the far left, those who were in the 30s and 40s had a tremendously uh, surprising abnormality with their cognitive function. So most of us didn't think that the old people would come out with normal cognitive function, but we didn't. But we also had no uh, preconceived notion that 40 and 30 and 40 year olds surviving critical illness would leave with this sort of cognitive dysfunction. Another thing that we began to see somewhat differently is just the confirmation that delirium, just the presence of inattention in the ICU, not hallucinations and delusions, but the inability to pay attention, would be the strongest predictor of long-term cognitive impairment. You can see here there's a nice do dose response that we, uh, had con that we were basically confirming from some other investigations. And others have began seeing, this, begun seeing the same thing. This is a paper from Walters et al in the Netherlands where they found over a th in over a thousand survivors of the ICU. You can look at the third and fourth bullet with, uh, well, you could if it showed up. Multivariable analysis showed that if you adjust for other covariates, that delirium was the strongest independent predictor of mild and severe cognitive impairment with a doubling or a tripling of the likelihood of cognitive impairment. 
Others have found uh, similar findings. This is very helpful when we see that the ARDSnet, studying, if you look on the far left, 2008 to 2012 in the Eden Omega cohort, and then in the sales cohort 2010 to 2014, once again, six and 12 month uh, prevalence rates of cognitive impairment of 36 and, and 30%. So this has now been found and confirmed multiple times, different cohorts around the world, that our patients are leaving the ICU with essentially a dementia-like problem that we didn't know existed five to 10 years ago. Here's another way that we began seeing things differently. You know the term post-operative cognitive dysfunction, or think of cardiothoracic surgery, think of pump head. Well, this is the first prospective study of this size. We just published this a month ago in the Annals of Surgery, where we were able to find lots of technical difficulties. This doesn't shift uh, the slides. Let me see if I can get it over here. Okay. Uh, if you look at a, a similar layout on these data, and then look at the bottom, and you can see that on, the, on this graph here, surgery and no surgery. So this, in this large cohort study, which actually had over 1,000 patients, 800 of whom were the original brain cohort, but then we had another 300 of veterans, sir, uh, soldiers, that we pooled together with this prospective cohort. It was always designed to be analyzed uh, a priori together. And we found no evidence that the surgical versus the non-surgical patients had any difference whatsoever in their amount of post-ICU cognitive dysfunction. And uh, this is, I'll give you an analogy. I begin to think of this as, the, as noses. GKC, GK Chesterton years ago said that, uh, that noses are come in all different shapes, sizes, and colors. But really, if you look at their function and what they have in common, they're more similar than they are disparate. And I would say that ICUs come in a similar fashion. Whether in our hospital we look at our trauma ICU, our burn, neuro, cardiovascular, medical, surgical, you name it, what got the patient into the ICU is something wholly different. But on the back end of the ICU, if you take out people with macro brain injury, like a TBI, bonk on the head, or a stroke, or an ICH, if you take out the macro injury, the micro injury that occurs diffusely throughout the cortex and in the, um, and in, in the, in the central areas of the, of the brain as well, white and dark matter, is really more similar than it is different. And this is just one good example of the fact that we were unable to see any differences in long-term brain dysfunction globally or an executive function. So if you look across domains of cognitive function, there's nine or 10 that we've measured, memory and executive function are the two most common abnormalities. So when you're talking to your patients, if they say to you, okay, doc, nurse, whoever you are caring for me, I get it, you're telling me that I might have a problem with my thinking on the back end, and then they say, well, what kind of problem? What, what am I actually gonna experience in my life that's not the way it used to be? then what you can tell them is that they might have problems with their memory and their executive function. So doing lists, uh, remembering names, doing computer programs at work, <clears throat> this sort of thing. If it's an older person and, and, and their wife is sending them to the store and they're not working anymore, so this is kind of where their executive function comes out, they're not gonna get home with all the things they were supposed to go get at the store. Now some of you may think that that happens to you already, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it would be an exaggerated, uh, exaggerated situation. The other thing is uh, driving. If you think of um, Kahneman's famous book that he won the Nobel Prize for, Thinking Fast and Slow, he describes that if you're driving down the street and your kids are in the back, you can drive and yell at your kids at the same time, but if you have to turn left into traffic, think about that for a second, you have to stop what you're doing, you know, not focus on the kids and look and see where's the break in the traffic, okay, gotta go left, you can't do that on autopilot. You've gotta use your executive function to do that sort of thing. And we're finding that our, our ICU survivors are having a lot more wrecks than they used to have. So these are some examples, executive dysfunction and memory that our patients are experiencing, no matter what kind of ICU they come from. So we've done some imaging studies. This is an example of two anecdotal patients, one on the far left where we did, who did not have delirium, the one on the far right that uh, did have a tremendous amount of delirium. And they are just examples of the fact that in our MRI studies, whether they be anatomic MRIs, DTI, or even our PET studies, we're finding cognitive function is manifesting itself from a neuroimaging perspective in terms of atrophy. Atrophy and fractional anisotropy in terms of electro electrical connectivity in the brain is very abnormal after the ICU. So this gets me to the clinical aspect of the talk. 
This pain, agitation, delirium setup, the guidelines which were published several years ago, and by the way, they're being updated right now, so the PADES guidelines, pain, agitation, delirium, early mobility, sleep guidelines, are going to be the PADES, are going to come out in one year. John Devlin is leading that effort. And these guidelines have helped us to see things differently in terms of how do we focus our attention in the ICU to help reduce human suffering. If you just think of these elements as pieces of human suffering that we want to reduce in order to magnify dignity and help people preserve self-worth. You know, there'd be nothing perhaps more undignified than sitting in a bed, not being able to control your bowel and bladder, and being delirious and confused and not understanding why you're there and perhaps being in pain. So these guidelines help us as their caretakers to do a better job in, redu in reducing those issues. And the delirium piece was the last one added. Pain and agitation guidelines have been around since 2002, but only this most recent set of guidelines had the D piece. And you can see why. Back in the day when the last guidelines came out in 2002, there was nothing going on in this area. Then we built some tools by which to measure this problem, and it was kind of like if you build it, they will come, and now people are doing lots and lots of research in this area. And in the, uh, in the spirit of this change issue that I, I challenged all of you about at the very beginning, you know who this is on the slide here, Malcolm Gladwell. Some of you have read his book, the Tipping Point, anybody? Uh, in, in the Tipping Point book, Gladwell talks about what is it that's required for something to tip, for something to change course. And he provides some great examples. The first one in the book, I think, is the hush puppy, the shoe. Uh, you have to read it to get that story. I don't have the time to tell it to you. But these are my twin daughters here with Malcolm Gladwell. And they had read his book, and they loved meeting him. It was very exciting for them. One of the things that Gladwell talks about that's required for change is an ambassador, a salesperson. And sitting on the front row here is Yahya Shahabi, one of the leaders of your ANZICS group here uh, in, the, in, the, in this wonderful country. And you can take all the landmark studies you want from ANZICS, Safe, chest, nice sugar, arise, adrenal, ongoing. But the SPICE programs that Yaya has built with your ANZIX CTG really holds primacy as the first research program in ANZIX to have originated right here in your, in your country. And uh, it's a beautiful thing to know that you have this ambassador, you have this, this leader, this, uh, this expert in the area right here under your nose. In fact, I just wanted to highlight a few of his pieces of work in this area. This is one of my favorite papers. In fact, of all of the work, Yaya, that you have done, I would say this graph on the right is my favorite. This is a very convincing and very simple graph. And our, our nicest pieces of data are those that are so simple that you just cannot ignore the fact that this Kaplan-Meier curve shows a much worse survival amongst the patients who were deeply sedated there in the dashed bar. And that's after adjusting. He found that this was consistent even after adjusting for lots of covariates that you might think have led, would have led to this worsening survival. But indeed, the, simply the depth of early sedation was, uh, was a major predictor of this problem. Some of the other work from Yaya, this SPICE and EGDS studies, uh, if, you don't, if you haven't read this body of work, just PubMed his, his uh, name and do yourself a favor and sit there for a couple of hours and read this work because it's absolutely game changing and uh, originated right here, right here at home. So back to the PAD then. So what are the ways that we had to look at things differently when we looked, when we reviewed the 20,000 peer reviewed manuscripts that we did to come up with these guidelines? One of the papers that we pulled there, which actually, um, I was really fascinated by was the original Gita Mehta study in JAMA that had looked at um, spontaneous awakening trials coupled with spontaneous breathing trials. This is a paper that came out subsequently, so hang tight on the graph and I'll tell you on, on the quote and I'll tell you what I'm, why, I, why I put this particular quote in there. So in 2008, we published a paper called the ABC study in Lancet. And in that study, we coupled Spontaneous awakening trials, step A, was spontaneous breathing trials, step B. So at the bedside, it equated to turning off sedation, letting the patient wake up to verbal stimulation, and as soon as they would wake up to, Miss Smith, open your eyes, then we would turn off the ventilator and do a spontaneous breathing trial. When we did that, just put those two things together, as compared to the group that was, had their sedation protocolized and managed according to the team, we found that the group who got the combined SAT-SBT we're getting off the ventilator four days earlier out of the ICU and the hospital four days earlier. 
So then Gita Mehta and the Canadian group restudied the same thing, and on the Kaplan-Meier curve, superimposable graphs. Wow, what gives? Why in one set of hands in a multi-center study is there a four-day difference, and in the other hand, in the other set, nothing? And then they published this paper with really, which really tells the tale. Um, she said, she wrote, this is from Lisa Burry, and Gita is one of the authors here, we found that nearly all the patients were managed with continuous infusion, opioids, and sedatives. We also found that the actual practice was different from what we expected because the available clinical tools, such as protocols and assessment scales, were not necessarily applied at the bedside. And this gets at what we all know. You put something on paper, you say to do it, and then we don't change what we're doing at the bedside. And I went to the Western. I was there and I walked around with the nurses, one of the places that the, this RCT was done. And I talked to the nurses. I, I was just dying to, to talk to these people. Because I'd seen this negative study. I thought, what, what's going on? I said, were you part of that study? Oh, yeah, yeah, we did, we did the study. I said, well, what, what happened? She goes, oh, well, we hated that study. Why'd you hate it? Because we want our patients deep. I mean, that's the way we keep, keep people comfortable. Well, then what happened when you were randomized to turn the drugs off? Oh, we turned them off and then we just turned them back on as soon as somebody walked away. And that, that bore out in the literature. If you looked at the average, the preceding studies, J.P. Cress's New England Journal study and our Lancet study, we had benzo, average benzos were cut in half in our two studies. And then if you looked at the, at the Canadian study, and this is not to diss anybody. I mean, I think the, this Canadian study is super important. So don't take the wrong thing from my point. My point is that all these studies together help us to learn. And I've talked about this with all these Canadian investigators. Only through their negative study did we start to piece together what happens at the bedside, which was, in their case, they actually increased benzo use. They went from 80 median to 110 milligrams a day of average benzo use in the intervention group. So that's not going to do anything to get somebody off of a ventilator earlier, right? So we have to change. So the second thing that Malcolm Gladwell says is to be sticky with your message. Do something that makes people remember what you're telling them to change. So in keeping with that, uh, I wrote this on an airplane once going, to, going out to California. What happened was Gordon Moore, you know who Gordon Moore is? Billionaire, he invented, in, he started Intel, it's like computer chips. So Gordon Moore, this billionaire, uh, said, uh, well he got sick. He went into hospital and he got profoundly delirious and his family was not allowed to be around him. After he came out, he was like, well that was hell and I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna give some money to Society of Critical Care Medicine and I'm gonna fund a program and it's gonna to be to put in place routine screening for delirium, incorporate the family, yada yada. So they asked if I would be a PI of it. Michelle Ballas on the front row is, uh, is absolutely one of the leaders of it. We co-chair this ICU liberation program. And on the plane out to Palo Alto on my iPad, I wrote down this, this little thing here, which on the left shows the PAD, these are symptoms, in the middle is how we monitor for the symptoms. On the right is this bundle, this A to E bundle at the time. The reason I did this is people kept asking, what are we doing? Are we doing PAD? Are we doing the ABCDEs? Are we doing ICU liberation? And that question was frustrating to me because I thought, it's all the same. It's, it's, just, it's just symptoms we monitor for and how we manage them. So finally, when we put them side by side, we realized, oh, okay, now everybody can see, let's implement this. And that's changed the way we care for human beings in the bedside. But Gordon Moore said, I'm not going to give you the money in case you, unless you incorporate family. And I said, well, that's not a problem. F comes after E. We'll just make it the A to F bundle. So we did. And uh, the reason I think this bundle is helpful, I know you have your Australian football, but this is American football. And most of what we do in the ICU oftentimes feels like we're going sideways. Here's Elway going sideways, uh, trying to get over the, line, the uh, touchdown line. And I thought, you know, this picture depicts a lot of times the way that our ICUs feel when they're not organized. Instead, what if we could achieve this? Tom, ba Tom Brady in the pocket. Perfect setup to have time to do his reads and, uh, and get that pass off. So can we achieve this degree of teamwork? And the A to F bundle is essentially there to provide you a way to do that. This is our ICU Delirium website, icudelirium.org. There's the ADF bundle on the, on the left there. There's also the iculiberation.org website. So you can go to either of these websites, figure out, read, and learn how to do this. Across the United States, we have about 80 hospitals, 70 adult and 10 pediatric doing this work. And what they're doing over a two-year period is, is working out the kinks. 
how at the bedside do we actually do this quality improvement work and, and figure out how to get the right people to the table to change our culture? And we just certainly don't have the time during my talk here to teach you how to do that, but in the Q&A, you can ask challenging questions. Michelle and I, Yaya, Brian, we will give you our best answers as to how to overcome the pitfalls of, uh, of failed attempts. But I will say uh, one analogy I use is that people say, oh, we tried it, it didn't work, or it worked for two months and then we failed. And I always use the smoking cessation quit attempt mantra, which is when my patients come in and they say, uh, you know, I'm smoking like crazy again, I say, well, have you, have you tried? And they go, oh yeah, I tried and failed. And I say, oh, okay, how many times? Three, uh, perfect. Three failed quit attempts is the average number of failed quit attempts prior to a success. So great, you've got your three failed, let's go for the fourth successful one. And so never let somebody tell you that they tried, couldn't do it, and therefore are giving up. No way. That just means you've learned something, and the next time you go back in, you'll do it better. So the bundle, just to leave you with the way that it now reads, is A is pain. We wanted pain to be number one. So A is assess, prevent, and manage pain. B is, and with the way the nurse will do this at the bedside, rather than read this to you, I'll tell you what the nurse will say. So Dr. Ely, this is Ms. Smith. She's on her third day of ARDS and mechanical ventilation. Today, her CPOT score is a three out of eight. So that means she's in some active pain. I need to up her narcotics. B, on her SATs and SBTs, we turned off her sedation this morning. I did not turn off her narcotics because she is in a little active pain. Her CPOT's a three. So, but we did turn off her sedatives. She's waking up. Her RAS is now a zero. It was a minus two overnight. And so because her RAS is now zero, I'm going to go ahead and turn off her ventilator. She's now going through her SBT, as you see. Choice of drugs, we did not have her on any benzodiazepines. We had her on some, uh, on some propofol. That's what I've just shut off. In terms of D, uh, the delirium, she is CAM positive. So she's RAS zero and CAM positive and delirious. Because of that D being positive, I've run through the Dr. Dre, which I'll teach you in a moment. That's diseases, drug removal, and environment. Um, and then she'll tell me what she did in terms of those interventions. Um, e, early mobility. I've got the physical therapist and I are both going to get this patient out of, out of the bed as soon as uh, the SBT is done. If she fails the SBT, we'll then mobilize her on the ventilator. If she passes, we'll extubate her and then mobilize her. Sometimes we do that in reverse. And then F, we have the family right here with us. They're going to ask us some questions at the end. We always invite the family onto rounds. And then we, we do the regular medical talk. And at the end, I turn to the family, give them a one-minute lay summary. And then they are able to ask up to two minutes of questions. We don't put a stopwatch on them, but they are told in advance, this is not a 10-minute you know, question and answer session. If you need longer, we'll set up a family conference for you. So that's how the A to F bundle works. It's been a game-changing experience in our ICU. And the next thing I want to do is tell you this. So if you walked out of here and said, oh, he was talking about that A to F bundle again. You know, it sounds all cute and everything, but is it really science? Is, you know, is this based on science? So I thought, I'm just going to show you just the New England Journal, JAMA, and Lancet papers upon which the bundle is based. Okay? The only letter of the six-letter bundle that's not based on any New England Journal, JAMA, or Lancet papers is the pain part. Pain literature is difficult. That's a hard thing to study. There are no NEJM, Lancet, or JAMA papers. There's about 250 to 300 papers that we use to create this bundle. There's about 30 of them just from those three top-tier journals. So the B, you can see the New England Journal, JAMA, and Lancet. That's the SATs and SPTs. C, choice of drug, a slew of JAMA and Lancet papers. I'm not going to go over these. I'm just showing you the degree of literature. D, JAMA and Lancet. E, early mobility. Look at all that. Huge amounts of literature there. The most recent of which is not on this slide, but they just had one come out, Sholly, in, uh, in, in Lancet. Excellent manuscript on surgical ICUs and early mobility. F, uh, I, I told you kind of jokingly that I added the F because Gordon Moore made, it, made us, but really look at the amount of literature there for F. JAMA, New England, uh, very profound amount of literature. And why are we doing this? Because acutely, we want to get people off the blower and out of the ICU sooner, but long term, we want to have them go back to a more complete life. A life that is not you're fired from your job because you can't do it, or a life of I'm miserable, my quality of life stinks now compared to what I wanted it to be. And so post-intensive care syndrome now accruing quite a bit of data to, to stimulate us to do a better job. All right, so I just wanted to leave you with that to knowledge.
but that's really what's behind this, this ICU liberation program. These are the goals of this program, optimizing pain, breaking the cycle of deep sedation, reducing delirium, improving short and long-term outcomes, and don't forget about cost. Absolutely cost effective and big time reductions in expenditures for patients, both acutely, we have another paper we're submitting right now about, deli about the cost of delirium. So if you reduce a day or two of delirium, that's a pretty big deal in terms of cost. And then uh, long term, less bounce backs, less long term healthcare needs if you're healthier and doing well. Uh, make no bones about it, folks, this is a, a big time public health problem. Uh, we, we can talk about smog, we can talk about heart disease, take your pick. But there are millions and millions of people around the world leaving critical care under our nose who are leaving with a dementia-like problem and it's creating an entire score of the cohort of our world that have a dementia that didn't have it before. So some of these people are having a de novo dementia, some of them are having an accelerated form of what they would have already gotten in 10 years. We don't have all that worked out yet, but it's a, it's a pretty big deal for us to focus on in critical care. So I decided I would show you one study. Michelle Ballas has done a study that preceded this one. She published it in Critical Care Medicine a few years ago. But this is a new bit of data, and I'm from Louisiana. And down in Louisiana, we have the Cajuns, and our, our French, we use the word lanyap a lot down there. Lanyap is a little something extra. So this is a little something extra for you. These are unpublished data, which we will be revealing in uh, January of this year in Hawaii at SCCM. This paper will come out in the February issue of CCM. It's already in press. And so what this is, is a study that was organized by Marianne Barnes Daly at a non-ivory tower, multi-hospital, community hospital setting in California called Sutter Health. And I love it because it wasn't an academic medical center. These were everyday, you know, hardworking community hospital uh, caretakers who weren't used to doing large investigations, et cetera. And I think it's critical for us to reproduce what has been done in randomized controlled trials in this sort of setting. So they took 6,000 patients over 15 months, and what they did in this study was they implemented this same, this is now the formalized version of that airplane iPad thing that I told you I drew up on the way to meet Gordon Moore. And so you see on the left, PAD. See in the middle, the tools we used, that they used in this trial. And on the right, this is the ABCDEF bundle. And if you haven't gleaned yet, this is a checklist. So what people do is they print this up, they have it on rounds, and they say, hey, we're doing the PAD, we're gonna do it through our bundle, which of these things on Miss Smith today have we done? And if we haven't done the C, D, and E, why not? And uh, so this keeps us honest in terms of compliance. I think it's uh, something that, that we can really uh, employ at the bedside. And after doing that, look at what Mary Ann Barnes Daly found. So both graphs are set up the same. 6,000 patients on the x-axis, you've got percent compliance with the bundle. Going from 0% compliance to 100% compliance. On the left, you have more ta you have survival. So you can see on the left that as you go up in compliance with the bundle, you have a stepwise increase in the likelihood of survival, which is after, look at the bottom, note, adjusted for age, Apache, and mechanical ventilation. Seven community hospitals adjusting for how sick they were, for how old they were, and if they were on or off mechanical ventilation. And the bundle compliance itself achieved a dose response so that every 10% increase in compliance resulted in, you can see odds ratio 1.15, a 15% increase in survival. Now go over to the next graph, which is delirium coma freedom. That means alive and free of delirium and coma, and the same thing. For every 10% increase in compliance, a 15% improvement in delirium and coma freedom. So the old way, sedated, on the vent. This EEG is capturing microarousals, lack of deep sleep, uh, stage, stage one, two sleep, no, no uh, slow wave sleep, which is very catabolic way to try and recover from a critical illness. <clears throat> Instead now, uh, I, I learned from Louis Zamperini. This is me sitting with Louis Zamperini, who is the subject of Unbroken. Anybody read this book? Amazing book. Uh, Louis said to me this, I was sitting there with him and he said, uh, he said, so what, Doc, what do you want to know? I said, Louis, you know, tell me about the main thing that you learned in this travail of yours, ending up in a Japanese prison of war camp and being shot down over the Pacific. He said, Doc, it's change. And that's exactly what he said. You're sitting on this couch, he just said change. Change is the most important word in the English language. 
He said, one minute I was looking this way, the next minute I was looking that way, and I never looked back. I've, I had to change. And when he said it, it just rang out in my head, I see you. We've got to be able to change what we're doing. And so we've worked hard to do this. What happens in the meantime between 1970 and 2015 was a downturn in critical care. Back in the 70s, we were walking people. This is San Francisco General. This lady's on a ventilator. She's walking. Her nurse is helping her. Remember, you don't need a physical therapist to mobilize a patient on a ventilator. Mobility is a basic component of good nursing care. So I would say 80% of our mobility is done with no physical therapist. It's done with two nurses or a nurse and an intern or a nurse and, a, and an occupational therapist or a pharmacist or anybody who can help. And so after the 70s, in the 80s and 90s, we started getting fancier with mechanical ventilation. We started using inverse ratio. We started paralyzing and sedating patients. And we completely did away with mobility. Fast forward over the next last 10 to 15 years, and now it's back. So we've come full circle. And now we are mobilizing our patients, even on the vent. Look at all that stuff that she has there. Thumbs up sign, absolutely. Failing your SBTs up and at them moving, which will make a tremendous difference in her life when she gets off the ventilator. A couple more clinical examples and I'll bring it to a close. This lady is my patient. She had necrotizing fasciitis of her face. We took her to the OR multiple times. This was the beginning. We ended up taking off about two thirds of her face. She was given the ABCDEF bundle every day very aggressively. This is after the first set of operations. She allowed me to use these pictures, by the way. This is all HIPAA. This is no HIPAA violation here. And on the day that she finally passed her SBT and was extubated, I snapped this picture with my iPhone. She's up and down the halls walking. Now you know that if she had not been getting that bundle with daily shutoffs of the sedatives, daily SBTs, daily mobility, et cetera, et cetera, there's no way she's walking down this hall like this on the day she gets off the blower. No way. Then you have to build this, and we have to build it, and that's our job. Here's a guy who's up for a liver transplant. He's got bilateral infiltrates. He's failing his SBTs miserably every day. And here he's texting his kids while his wife looks on. A new day. Awake and alert in the ICU. Ten years ago, no way. Here's one of my favorites. These pictures are smaller. In these five shots, you can see a patient who my, my patient, who I did, I took out my iPad, my iPhone, just snap, 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 got his permission to use these. He is deaf. What would it be like to be deaf? intubated, delirious, unable to communicate or hear in the ICU. And yet how much more dignity and self-worth do we bring to the bedside if we have him awake and delirium free and he can sit there and talk to his nurse, Ellen, who has, uh, who, whose grandfather taught her sign language when she was a little girl. And so here they are on the right and she's just back and forth having a conversation. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in the ICU. And you don't have to have fancy equipment. Kasia Kottis from Poland sent me this picture. <laughs> so what? It's a grocery cart, okay? Just put your stuff in a grocery cart, get up and go. And uh, I mean, this is a beautiful shot. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna publish this one too in, uh, in the February issue of CCM. But we got permission from this, this wife, who on her left is her husband. What is that like for the husband to see his wife up and at him when she can't come off the blower yet? She's failing spontaneous breathing, she's profoundly hypoxemic, and yet she's able to do this. So regarding delirium sedation, let's focus on the modifiable pieces. Just know that uh, the miss rate for delirium is a steady 75, 80% if you don't monitor for this. You've got to monitor the bedside for this problem or you will miss it. And I promised you I'd teach you to Dr. Dre. Uh, I don't take credit for this. A nurse asked me, Dr. Wes, what do you do when somebody tells you that the cam is positive? And I said, well, I have this mnemonic called think and blah, blah, blah. She goes, no, shut up. Shut up. She goes, that's too complicated. I know it's on your website. It's too complicated. Uh, it stands for toxins, hypoxemia, heart failure, uh, infections, immobility, non-pharmacologic, and, and, uh, and, and potassium, uh, and metabolic stuff. So she said, shut up. Shut up. What, what do you do? Just, I tell you they're delirious. What do you say? And I said out loud, I do diseases, drug removal, and environment. And without even a batting an eye, she goes, oh, the Dr. Dre. Whoa, how'd you do that? So she came up with it. It's the Dr. Dre, it's now what we use. The drug reme disease remediation, sepsis, COPD, CHF, drug removal, and environment. The beauty of it is you are removing drugs 
taking care of underlying diseases, and fixing the environment before you ever go to write a new prescription for another drug. This is the right way to handle things, okay, to start. We're doing a, a trial, though, of antipsychotics around the country. We've got a randomized trial going on, placebo control. We've already enrolled over 1,000 patients. Uh, what you really want in the ICU is your people to be up and awake and alert eating a banana, right? This is just the beautiful picture that uh, of we want of health in the ICU. But sometimes we don't get that. And I wanted to close just with two or three pictures of the other side of the ABCDEF bundle. One third of my patients dies before they leave the hospital in a medical ICU. That's a pretty standard number. Not the ICU, but the hospital. This is uh, Dr. Paquette. Dr. Paquette was dying of IPF in the, in the ICU. I asked him, what do, you, what do you need me to do for you? How can I serve you? He said, get me my monks. So I said, absolutely. They were in Alabama, we're in Tennessee. It was a four hour drive. I got the monks to the bedside. Here they are with his family. That was our job. Provide a good dying process for him. That was accomplished by the ABCDEF bundle because he was awake and alert as he was dying. He told me what he wanted. The family's around the bedside. That's what we need to do. The patients aren't going to make it. Another story, this is the closure. This guy, uh, his son there taking care of him, he had pretty profound uh, sepsis, ARDS. <clears throat> the team said, well, I said, what does he want? He said, he wants to be baptized. I said, okay, well, baptism, not a big deal. Sprinkle him with some water, no biggie. I'm Catholic, so that's how we do it. I said, no, no doc, dunk. Dunk? <laughs> yes, in a pool. But no, but yes. I said, okay, let's figure it out. So we, uh, we did. We made a pool in the ICU. We dunked him. Uh, you can read about this in the Wall Street Journal or in Intensive Care Medicine. Read the story. It's quite interesting. But I close with the note that the ABCDF is not just about living. It's also about dying. We have to take care of both. Thank you. Uh, no, um, thanks so much, Chris. Um, yeah. I'll, why don't we take a few questions, if there are any. Um, I certainly have a similar experience where every uh, for, for we have an intubated patient where um, um, he was very religious, like with, and uh, he offered me a blessing before my ward round for the whole week. <laughs> that was fantastic. He would just bless me, and then I, then I, then I can do my ward round. <laughs> okay, uh, any questions? I'll probably take one or two for now. Yeah, yeah. please. Go. Yes. David, you want me to do it right here? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, she's, I heard about this trial last night. I'm excited about it. 800 patients, melatonin, excellent. Um, culture change of, of getting the, the cams finished. Not me. Um, so, yeah, so you need to make sure that the people collecting your data are able to use the data clinically the bedside. If they're collecting the data and the doctors don't pay attention to it, they're going to hate it and they're going to run away with their tail between their legs. So you have to incorporate a conversation. The number one thing I can tell you, the number one thing to do is that at the bedside, whoever's collecting the data on delirium and RAS, et cetera, this PAD stuff, they have to be able to say out loud what they found and then somebody has to use that information. That's why I gave you the Dr. Dre. Super fast, super easy. If they collect it and nobody does anything with it. Or if they say out loud the patient's CAM positive and the doctor who is insecure and has an ego problem doesn't know what to do with that information, they will then ignore it and go, well, what are we doing with the CT scan today? What are the antibiotics? And just blow right by it. Then that nurse doesn't want to do that anymore because that's embarrassing to provide information nobody uses. So have a conversation out loud on rounds at the bedside with that information. That's my number one recommendation. Okay. One more question maybe? Patients going to high dependency with delirium, do you have any tips on how we can do with that? You mean when they're leaving the ICU and, yes. and leaving? Yeah, we found that about 10 to 15 percent of people leave the hospital with delirium. About 20 percent of people leave the ICU with delirium. So as they transition, that's an especially dangerous period of time for delirium. As you know, transitions are dangerous for everything, falls, clots, you know, pressure sores, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, this is a time where you need to have a handoff of the information that you collected in the ICU with regard to delirium. So here is the second, if you said, Wes, what are the two things that you did that stopped you from implementing success failing, implementing success failing? One of them was we created the script on rounds 
so that every nurse every day said out loud what they found and we used the information. The second thing we did was we put delirium in the water. That's what I call it. And what we, when we put delirium in the water, it meant that we taught every nurse in the entire hospital about delirium, not just the ones in the ICU. So that way, when your nurse in the unit says, Miss Smith is going to high dependency, uh, John, Miss Smith is coming out of the ICU, uh, she is delirious, she's CAM positive. John doesn't go, delirium, CAM, who cares? He goes, oh yeah, I was taught about that. I know what that means. That means she's still delirious, brain down, predictor of long-term cognitive impairment, death, cost, etc. So I need to think of the Dr. Dre. So when she gets over here, what have y'all been doing for the delirium? And I'll continue that. You need to have a continuity. Okay? Okay. Thank I know so I've much, extended please. my time. Thank you very much. I was just done reading our next speaker's bio, and I just realized the front row of today's discussion is probably worth about $50 million, and at the second row, we're probably close to 100. So um, you can read his bio, which is, again, takes about another 10 minutes to read, so I won't do that. Um, has anyone got any sticky tape for the AV guy in the back? It'd be great. <laughs> um, but it'll, it'll go okay? Great. So uh, without, um, I think one of the things that we are uh, certainly become very topical is the follow-up after uh, ICU. And uh, we have an expert on this area here with us today, all the way from Toronto, um, Brian Cuthbertson. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I love coming to Australia. It's my first time in Western Australia after spending quite a lot of time in the East. It's uh, fantastic to be here. My declaration is I am not sponsored by Hospira and you're about to find out why. <laughs> what do our patients want to ask us once they get through ICU? We used to wave goodbye to them as they left the ICU going, a job well done. They're off, you know, into the sunset. Sadly, it's not the case. But they may say to you, well, why, why did I survive? And of course, we know fine that age, severity of illness, uh, comorbidities in their primary diagnosis, Apache 2, basically, we've known this since the 80s, these determine ICU mortality. But that's all behind them now, isn't it? Surely it's time to not look back, it's time to look forward. Unfortunately, looking back tells you a lot about the future for our patients going forward. What does the future hold for me, doctor? Are you saying I could still die? And sadly, we probably are. Here's the data from our own five-year cohort that shows general age and sex match controls. Compare yourself to your peers or your partner or whatever else. Uh, uh, compared to ICU survivors, yes, a huge mortality early, but these curves continue to uh, uh, splay apart. Uh, there's an excess mortality seems to be present there. Here's some nice work from Perth, Australia, Western Australian data from Teresa Williams et al. showing the general population over 16 years. And here's the ICU survivors continuing to die at a higher rate. Now, there are some problems with this, and I'm going to focus a lot on the problems with this data, which is over, uh, uh, over extrapolating and uh, attributing uh, mortality. But it is there. In fact, after the first two, three years, probably one and a half times the rate of death for ICU survivors, I started saying ICU is the new comorbidity. We should think of it like we think of heart failure and cirrhosis in the liver. If you look at the different types of illness, this is poorly controlled data. It looks like these different disease states may have different mortalities. I actually believe if you control this properly, that critical illness probably has similar levels of mortality, perhaps with some exceptions like trauma. Was it how sick I was? Will I ever get over how sick I was? Well, the fact is, is that your severity of illness will indeed determine your long-term outcome, as shown here by Naz Lohan from uh, Scotland. And indeed, if you actually compare, uh, so agent, agent sex match controls is useful for sure, but actually there are some other comparisons that are also important. So if you compare age and sex match controls with hospitalized controls, because being in hospital is not good for you, especially if you're old and uh, compare them to ICU survivors, then the attributable mortality for being critically ill in intensive care compared to being in a hospital is actually not that big, but it is present. It's only about 2 to 3% over five years here in a large Scottish database. How long do I have? Well, this data doesn't tell you how long the patients have, but if you think about this, if that's the Kaplan-Meier over five years, if I extrapolate this on, then they hit the zero mark earlier if you're an ICU patient. You've got a mortality gap. You're going to die earlier it would seem, as I say, maybe not as much as, uh, as, as much as we thought because we're matching them when they leave ICU and sometimes we're matching them when they enter ICU and of course if you match them when they enter ICU there's a huge excess early mortality which actually leads to an over-attribution of death. 
So the determinants of long-term outcome, you'll notice, are identical to the determinants of short-term mortality. Short mortality, I should say, not outcome, generally, but mortality. They are the same. So your future will be determined by your past. Will I be disabled? Well, the fact is, is that uh, we know uh, that there is severe muscle dysfunction around the time of critical illness. Look in the top right here. That is a very diseased muscle. It's inflamed. The myofibrils are dying. They're contracted. They're inf there's inflammatory cells in there. That's not a healthy muscle to be going around with. And if you look at the muscle mass, which may or may not be a useful measure, then you'll see that by 10 days, you've lost nearly 20% of your muscle mass from being in bed. And even by three days, you've lost 5%. That's why we can't start too early with uh, thinking about this, because the muscle has been lost early. Here's a really useful pathway. Is it? I don't know. But what I do know is there's no drugs in that at all. <laughs> I have nothing I can intervene on there, and there's a lot of sort of pathways that I don't know about. It's not just your skeletal muscle. It's not, you can see your skeletal muscles wasting. We see it when we look at patients in the bed. We don't see their diaphragms very well. This is excellent work by Ewan Golliker from Toronto. This is a complex graph. I've probably misinterpreted it. If any of you are better than me at it, please feel free to tell me. But your diaphragmatic thickness uh, against your duration of ventilation and your diaphragmatic contractility on this three-way curve suggests to me that the, the patients, there's a phenotype of patients whose diaphragms get thin, the duration of ventilation as it gets longer, and they actually do really quite poorly, that group in there. But there's also a group whose actual diaphragmatic uh, thickness increases, and their contractile strength increases, and they probably hop off a ventilator. So I'm trying to get at phenotypes here. This is the red versus the green, which I'm going to come back to. Which muscle would you rather have in this picture? Would you rather have A, Arnold Schwarzenegger, or B, Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> And the fascinating thing, this is from James Batt, one of my colleagues in Toronto, is these two muscles had exactly the same contractile strength. So it's not all about size, even though I've spent a lot of my life saying it is. <laughs> How long will I take to recover? Well, from three months through to five years, this is our data from a cohort in Scotland, then you go from minus two standard deviations below the normal. You're a huge way below your sex and age match controls, and you end up at one standard deviation. If you take that back to pre-ICU, if you ask a, a surrogate to tell you what their loved one thinks about their quality of life, then the interesting thing is your loved one always says you have a worse quality of life uh, than you actually have. So I've always said to my ICU when my wife arrives in and says, Brian's life's miserable, you should let him slip away, that <laughs> that that's probably is not the case. <laughs> Saying that, if it was my ICU, they probably would let me slip away. <laughs> so there's a morbidity gap here. Uh, and uh, the problem is, though, is we don't know where they came from. And this is a huge problem for all of our studies I'm going to talk about. We're, we're looking at people in ICU and we're believing that they are the same. But in fact, they may have been for the last five years coming down from their age sex match control, slowly deteriorating with chronic illness. That's what may be happening uh, up to the time of ICU. They're not healthy when they come into ICU. And indeed, uh, that morbidity gap is huge. But of course, you cannot bring people back to where they were five years ago. When I first analyzed the data from this, I misanalyzed it, and I thought their quality of life was better than pre-morbid, and I thought, yes, I've got a, basically a Swiss clinic here, not one of the clinics that you go for end of life, but one of these ones you go to in the mountains and come out feeling stronger, and I thought, I'm gonna make a fortune, but it turns out it wasn't the case, and of course, you shouldn't be trying to do that. And of course, these patients may not be uh, deteriorating, they may have been chronically ill for ages. Look at this flat picture of chronic debilitation, way below norm. So if you try and get them back to the norm, then clearly that's unrealistic. You should be more uh, conservative in what you're trying to achieve with these patients. Will I get back to my golf doctor? Well, it's like playing the piano, isn't it? Uh, if you didn't play golf before you came into intensive care, <laughs> you won't be playing it afterwards. This is work from Wes and Jack Awashina, actually, which is unusual in the sense that we very rarely get to know what our patients are like before intensive care. But in this age cohort in America, they were following up people generally in uh, an aged cohort, and some of them became critically ill here. And they identified three potential phenotypes, these green, orange, and red, as I've marked them, who started with variable levels of comorbidity. This is activity of daily living. And indeed, all of them take a little bit of a step for the worst, but the worst ones ended up really quite severely disabled. Um, so it, I like to think of clinical phenotypes, and this is far from precise, but maybe there's people who come in healthy, have a severity of illness that's moderate or even severe, but they get back to their normal life. I call them the green goers. There's maybe people who come in on a morbid trajectory 
century get worse and actually never really get back to where they came from, but they, are, they have some potential. And then sadly, there's a group that actually just simply, if they survive ICU, and most of them don't, will probably die in the next year with a very poor quality of life, sadly. So the green goers are the ones that we walk around on a ventilator. Actually, walking around a ventilator makes us feel good, but in fact, these people are going to get better, whatever you do. So feel good about it. It's good for team morale, but I'm not sure it actually helps because that patient's going to get better, whatever you do. This patient is going to get packed to playing golf, but they're going to have an ICU nurse with them to do it. <laughs> but there's rehabilitation potential there. And sadly, this patient is not, and we should be thinking about excellent end-of-life care there and helping the family to understand what the true trajectory actually is. So the predictors of poor physical function are similar to the predictors of mortality, but there is ICU length to stay for physical function uh, that makes it a little bit different. Will I have my faculties? Well, uh, I'm not going to say a lot about this, but I'm going to deliberately be controversial. Again, here's uh, Jack and uh, Wes's work. And they looked at cognitive function before and after this event. And again, can you see two phenotypes here? Well, yes and no. But remember, these are not the same patients with time that are showing worsening here. But as on an average, in their cohort, there was more uh, psychological uh, uh, cognitive dysfunction afterwards. But we don't know about the trajectory. We don't know their baseline very well at all. They may come in with, uh, with uh, cognitive dysfunction and, and uh, delirium. Uh, and it may be that they rather equally move as you have this insult from one group up to another, a certain proportion moving up. But it may be far more chaotic than that. And I don't think we really know the trajectory. And we don't know why 83% of our patients don't get this. Let's have the, cla the glass four-fifths full here. A lot of our patients don't get this. What we do know, though, is delirium does cause dementia, although that relationship is not as marked as the confounded relationship we often find if we don't correct properly. But we also know that dementia is very common and people come into hospital, so a lot of people who we declare have dementia or delirium at the end of their ICUSD or during their ICUSD had it before, but nobody knew about it. So it's not new delirium, in fact. And, of course, delirium doesn't just cause dementia, but dementia causes delirium. So uh, we, have to be, we have to be really careful here, and the sicker our patients are, the more likely they are to have it. And remember, correcting for severity of illness is only reasonably good if you're looking at events in the first 24 hours where you measure severity of illness through Apache 2, and it's not good for these patients who are now days, weeks down the line, have got a fluctuant de uh, dementia or delirium picture, and their severity of illness has changed very markedly from where they were when they came into ICU. Again, we're at risk of over-attributing sensitivity and specificity of our metrics isn't as good as it should be. We're not identifying pre-morbid dementia, and it's confounded by sedation, residual uh, sedation effects, severity of illness, comorbidities, and the time to event that occurs within the ICU. If you look at psychological morbidity, then again, interestingly enough, you'll find similarities, but yet there's other things on this list, like previous psychiatric illness. And once again, we fail to spot that although 30% of our patients have depression and anxiety after intensive care, it looks like 30% of them have it before intensive care as well. Is it the same patients? I don't know, but it could be, and it's certainly not zero. Uh, and PTSD may be related to the traumatic event of being in intensive care, but that's not always as clearly linked as it could be. And the ripple effects of this are huge. The family, the economics of the family, the, the mental health of the family. And this paper, which I was lucky enough to be involved with in the New England from this year, indeed speaks to the fact that the majority of our family members have depression in the first year, and a lot of them doesn't get better. So can we conceptualize this? Well, think about the holistic thought of function. You can think about it at an organ level if you want, but think about the fact that function deteriorates with age until you reach failure and ultimately death. If you have an ICU critical illness event at this stage, you'll take a step down. And indeed, if you're one of these green uh, goer type patients, then you may go down parallel. You may even come back up to where your line was running at, but the red stoppers probably go into a dwindling pattern and go, uh, go on to die, sadly. And there is that mortality gap. The the WHO invite us to conceptualize this by thinking about this, a conceptual framework, physical and mental cognitive baseline status they're big on and we've not been big enough on, then the acute event, functional impairment of organs, functional impairment of the patient, down to poor quality of life. But this always seems a bit one-dimensional for me and maybe we should be thinking of this in a far more two-dimensional fashion as a journey of a patient as they have different events and different morbidities in life and go around this cycle. But even that feels a bit two-dimensional for me and I wonder if we should be thinking about a spiral, which sadly is often a downward spiral, when increased morbidity occurring and events leading to a worsening function, increased comorbidity and poor outcome leading to death. 
We don't know much about their inflammatory response, but the, the, a lot of these patients are severely inflamed. We don't know much about their ongoing impact of what happened in intensive care, but we know if they had kidney injury, they'll have a worse outcome. And we don't know what happens to them going forward, but some of them have an increased incidence of myocardial events afterwards. We've got a lot to know. What can we do to help? Well, we did this. This is the practical study, a multi-centre study from the UK that I led in the British Medical Journal in 2009. And we looked at UK practice. There was 80 centres in the UK doing uh, ICU follow-up. It was all different what they were doing. There was no standard model. What they knew was there was a problem. We got a problem, but they didn't know the solution. But nobody wanted to help. So they got about doing it themselves. So intensivists were doing outpatient clinics. Actually, none of us are trained for that, but it was well meant. And our nurses said, yeah, I want to be part of that. Of course I want. This is exactly what I should do as an ICU nurse. I'm not saying goodbye to them at the door. I want to be engaged. So it was very well, meaning we tried to copy the model. It was a very complex uh, 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 model we used. We sent them back to the ICU. We discussed their case. We, had, uh, we uh, sent them for physical assessment by surgeons and uh, physicians, etc. We assessed their psychological status. We brought them uh, to see psychiatrists on about a third of the occasion. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, we made absolutely no difference at all. None. We didn't even prove their satisfaction. <laughs> I think I probably got a row for calling them ungrateful bastards the other day. But uh, so I wouldn't say that in Canada, but I'm in Australia now, so I can say things more directly. Cost effectiveness, you don't know what this means and don't care what this diagram says, but let me just tell you, to be cost effective, you have to be below and to the right of that red line. This is above to the left. What this shows is it's cost effective to take this out of practice. Take it out. Not just, just keep doing it, or, you know, but it's actually to actively de-implement it. That's what the results show us there. Tim Walsh took on where we to, uh, left off with practical with his recover study, similar team, and did an even more complex and earlier intervention to try and improve out the outcomes. Again, a multifaceted, complex intervention. He made absolutely no difference at all. Turns out this is really hard. His, he showed it was also cost effective to take this out of practice. It does not work, it would seem. What about what you guys have done down here in the Antipodes? Well, uh, Doug Elliott and colleague did this amazing physical rehabilitation program, qualified trainers, verbal and written instructions, home visits. It was quite impressive. It was like having your own personal trainer. <laughs> and it was, I couldn't afford to pay for this. It was such an impressive uh, intervention. But sadly, they concluded that it did not increase the underlying rate of recovery from their physical illness. It did not work. And Linda Dennehy and colleagues from Melbourne did another extremely good intervention with starting in the ICU, going through the ward, going to outpatients. Again, very impressive. Again, absolutely no difference to outcome. So is there light at the end of the tunnel? Well, we quote this study a lot, Bill Swikert's study. It's a two ICUs within one centre study, and it only goes up to the time of uh, hospital discharge. Is it impressive? Yes, but it's not been replicated since then. So it actually now stands as a potential outlier uh, with this positive effect. Chris Burton, a very small study, again, showing physical exercise may be beneficial. The, the, the only real good multi-centred uh, trial is this of ICU diaries, and I believe a lot of you do this in Australia. Um, uh, I have some problems with the methodology, methodological issues with this, but it probably is a reasonably cheap and uh, a reasonable intervention. But here are the studies of ICU uh, interventions that start in the ICU and go on afterwards, and two of them are positive in the larger ones, and the rest of them are actually all negative or suggest either no effect or that it should be withdrawn from practice. So the sad news is that what we've done so far isn't working. And what have we done wrong? Well, we've done a classic bit of clinical epidemiology entirely wrong. We thought the critical illness was the exposure that led to the outcomes we see afterwards. That's how epidemiologists think. And then we said, well, maybe it's mediated by ICU interventions, delirium, comorbidities. But actually, we were entirely wrong. And that led us to over-attribute physical mortality, um, psychological mortality, delirium, and death. And we've overestimated all of them. All of them do occur at a higher rate, I believe, but not at as high a rate as our confounded results suggest. So we should be thinking of this differently. Our trajectory of our patients in a holistic sense, as a human being that's going through a journey of life and a journey of health, a healthy trajectory patient like this might have a lower acuity event and be a green goer. They've go, get on. They won't even answer your follow-up uh, uh, surveys because 
it doesn't mean anything to them anymore, they're well over it. Then there's the hugely complex morbid trajectory with multiple comorbid events. It could be dementia, it could be heart failure, it could be all sorts of things, cancer, leading up to someone who comes into our intensive care who if we believe their journey started in our critical care, then we're totally misinterpreting the journey of this patient. They will die, sadly, and if they don't die, they will have a very complex picture, which will have post-intensive care syndrome within it, but it's washed away by their comorbidity. We shouldn't be looking after these patients, I'm afraid. It's a geriatrician that should be looking after them because they're really good at chronic comorbidity, particularly in elderly patients. I'm afraid we have to hand over the mantle here. We've done our best, but it's not working to date. And then in the middle here, there's one group I think we can make a difference for. They're a healthy group. They have a high severity of illness. And indeed, post-intensive care syndrome is important to them. They don't have chronic comorbidity, and they do have rehabilitation potential. It's probably 20%, 30% of our patients at most. Uh, but they're the ones we should focus on that we, I think, can make a difference with ICU follow-up. So in conclusion, ICU care is associated with poor long-term quality and quantity of life, but it's not as poor as we previously thought. It is poor, though. You may not understand the ICU insult or the recovery issues well enough to understand the best interventions or who we should target them at. High-quality studies have failed to show benefit in this area. Uh, further studies need to be timed and need to identify the phenotypes who may uh, improve from this. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, I'll now invite the panel up and you can fire your questions away. So um, those of you who have a uh, rest of negative one, please get it to zero or one. Uh, so inviting to the panel right now, uh, I have Leonie uh, Westbrook. She is one of the ACCN's um, board members, vice president as well. And she has obviously had many, uh, much experience in, uh, as an investigator in this area in Australasian setting. I also have Michelle Ballas, uh, who is the uh, nursing, one of the nursing leads in the ICU Liberation uh, with Wes. And of course, she's one of our guest speakers at the conference. And of course, Michael Reed from um, Queensland with a lot of uh, experience and most well known for the Dahlia study that's recently conducted. So I will actually hand this over now to Brian, who will now moderate the session. I will be playing with this screen as we go. And uh, so don't go crazy and into a frenzy right now as I hand the mic to, to Brian. I think I'm, I'm good, thank you. Um, so thanks everybody. So you've, you've heard from many of us, but uh, this discussion is about trying to get uh, some views from you. I wonder if people would be willing to lead us off with some of their own experiences. You've heard a lot about uh, what Wes said about delirium, about making change. Um, I'd be fascinated if people would like to tell us a little bit about either how they've succeeded or maybe uh, the challenges they've met. And I'm seeing a hand at the back, yes please. Hi, I'm Jane Louise Cook from Brisbane. Um, I'm associated with a unit that currently doesn't uh, regularly assess for delirium. And a lot of time and money and effort has gone into recently um, doing some good evidence-based reviews of what should be done. But when presented to the senior staff, the implementation part was rejected on the basis of it's too much effort and they're, um, you know, for the nurses, they already have too much to do anyway. So I'm just interested in how people would propose to um, persuade their colleagues to actually take that first step. Yeah, great. Uh, Michelle, would you like to start us off with that? Sure, that's a great question and one that we're, faced, we're facing on a daily basis. Um, I can tell you from our experience, and I think somebody brought this question up before, there is a lot of investment that has to go up front in teaching the nurses how to do the CAM ICU properly. Um, it's not, it, literally once you start doing it, it takes less than 60 seconds to do once you know how to do it. What we're finding is, however, there does need to be investment up front to teach them the proper way of doing it. Meaning we see a lot of mistakes with um, being, CAM ICU results being documented as unable to assess. So what we're trying, really you should be able to assess delirium in everybody unless they're in a coma, right? So unless they have a RAS of minus four or minus five. What we're finding in the collaborative that we're doing is we do have a lot of those unable to assess, which suggests that there is a lot of education that needs to go up front to the nurses to teach them how to do that. Now I can also tell you that once the nurses are comfortable administering the CAM, even though we suggest it's done every 12 hours in our collaborative, they're doing it much more frequently when they're comfortable. 
But in terms of implementation, what we found best is to use champions. So to teach maybe four or five of the nursing staff how to properly administer the, the CAMICU. And then once those nurses <clears throat> are comfortable with it, teaching the nurses by giving them you know, the PowerPoint presentation, why you're doing this, why it matters, but then going with them to the bedside and having them perform the CAM ICU with the people that know how to do it. And after about three or four assessments, the nurses then get more comfortable with doing that. So the champions help a lot. If you can find a couple nurses on your unit that are willing to take this on, um, there's a great train. You don't have to do all of this stuff is available. If you go to icudelirium.org, they have the CAM ICU training manual there that has all the frequently asked questions and things like that. Does that answer? I, if I could, yeah. before Michael, if I could just compliment something that Michelle said. She said something that kind of contradicted something that Yaya said, so I want to clarify that. Yaya, one of your mantras here was the level of sedation. If one of the goals of monitoring for delirium is to reduce the level of sedation and stay adherent to the SPICE mantra that Yaya was teaching us, then uh, Yaya, it doesn't fit that you said some of the patients were too deeply sedated to assess for delirium. And, and at minus two, minus three, for example, might be the levels you were talking about. But I want, I want to kind of re-gear on and, and focus down on that comment by you. If our goal is to get somebody into the camp of delirium, if they are indeed delirious, so that we respond by doing things that will reduce their delirium, then saying to somebody at RAS minus two, minus three is too sedated to assess for delirium prevents the clinician from thinking about the need to do something. So let's just take the Betty Smith, she's minus two, and, and, and somebody says, oh, she's too deeply sedated to assess, we won't do that, we're only gonna assess once she's minus one. But then they're off the hook. Now the clinician can just say, oh, they're too deeply sedated, I don't, get, you know, I don't care, and they're not delirious. But if the trigger is, oh no, if they're not in a coma, that means if they respond to verbal, we're gonna allow them to be assessed for delirium, which is the way that the CAM was validated in the first place, coma, Delirium, normal. A, a brain totem pole. Delir coma, delirium, normal. And we, th we made that threshold at b between minus four and minus five. So minus four and five is coma because no response to verbal. Minus three and up is anything responding to verbal. So therefore, you can assess for delirium. We did that, on, we did that because of the way that the literature had used coma and delirium over the years, but it works for us to stay on task about putting the person in the camp of the diagnosis that we want to affect. So I think that I, I just wanted to tweak that comment. And it's very helpful, too, to have the cards for the, your nursing staff to have the RAS cards until they get familiar with what a RAS minus two means or if you choose SAS or something like that. So having those cards available, some people put them on their computer screens, pull them down, and they can do their CAM ICU assessments and their RAS assessments right at the bedside till they're comfortable knowing those different levels. But again, the important part being to, to really aim for that sedation level of zero, where they're alert and interactive. Um, could I maybe just throw one kind of practical comment addressing that question in. So they're, they're great practical tips on how to operationalize these tools. But just reflecting on, on our experience in Melbourne, which is where I was before Brisbane, we, we started our daily study there, we did the pilot study there, and we had a whole suite of delirium-related in interventions. Uh, plan before I then left and went to Brisbane, where I now have similar problems to uh, what you're describing. The, the way we succeeded in Melbourne was, was to give the nurses ownership of this task. And uh, all of my publications from Melbourne, uh, you'll see, have Glenn, East, Glenn Eastwood as, as the uh, co-investigator, uh, with him as first and me as second, or the other way around, because we recognised very early on that this was essentially a nursing problem. The, the doctors didn't care. The, yes, a lot of them come to these sorts of presentations and kind of notionally get it, but we're not standing by the patient's bedside every day. And, you know, when's the last time you saw a, a physician, a doctor, do a, a proper delirium assessment? It doesn't happen. So we realised that this was a nursing problem. And if we were going to tell the nurses to do the CAM ICU, that, that wasn't going to work. So, so rather than do that, we said, well, OK, we're going to assess doing the CAM ICU. You're going to tell us what you think of it, and we've published that. And we're going to assess the delirium rates that we find when we do it and compare it to other ways of doing it. Um, and, and that, I think, gave people the ownership to say, OK, we're not just having this foisted upon us. Now we're interested. Now that we're interested, we can think of some other questions as well. We'll do that too. So that's rolled on in Melbourne. It hasn't quite happened in Brisbane yet, but I'm ever optimistic. Okay, great. Let's get back to the floor. So I've got a lady here and then I've got Anthony at the back. So, uh... I've been working with a few units that have started to use a RAS um, and ITU CAM as a way to ideally 
in minimising station standardised charts to give the guidance amongst all staff on the floor to titrate and limit their medication based on their assessment. How, in your opinions, have you found, or if you've come across this, have they been successful in improving compliance with trying to minimise station yet manage patients? Leonie, do you want to come in on that? Quite sure, but it's about, and I think to Bing West's point about communication. So, in my experience and the stuff that I've done, using these sorts of tools are a way of standardising the language that the the multidisciplinary team can use to, to discuss what's going on with the patient. And so, I think that's possibly one of the strengths in terms of it actually demonstrating differences to outcomes. I think that's an entirely different question, and I'm not quite sure that we. Um, know the answer to that at an individual unit level, but the um, work I've been involved in is that it's about improving your ability to communicate and for everyone to have a shared language about um, talking about where that patient's at in terms of their sedation level, uh, their associated delirium and what plans you might make to, to, to adjust that. Thank you. Before we get to the next uh, question, um, I just thought yeah. a quick, quick show of hands in your unit if you have a, a systematic way of assessing pain agitation delirium and it's used at handover. Um, if you don't mind, uh, be very honest and put your hand up if your unit actually does that on a regular basis. Yeah. I just thought I'll quick to see yeah. how many it's, people it's in maybe, this room. It's maybe about ha just half, I think. Yeah, yeah about half. Here. Interesting. Um, um, Anthony Sands. Got a question for the panel, actually. I, the unit I work in, probably the most common admitting diagnosis is overdose. Um, we expect a lot of these people to be a hyperactive delirium as part of their toxicology. Would you recommend we try and have them deep while they're in this agitated state to stop them ripping their lines out and uh, punching the staff? Um, or do we try and keep them light and responsive and, de and deal with the physical aspects? So, all right, that's, that's a bit of a gimme question for me. So that, they are the patients in the Dahlia study, the hyperactive, agitated, delirium patients. And I accept that they're a minority. The minority of people have hyperactive delirium. Wait, can you give them a summary of your Dahlia study? Oh, yeah, sure, you sure. You can come tomorrow and hear it for half an hour. But um, in, in brief, <laughs> uh, we randomise people stuff. at the end of their ICU stay, so the back end that Wes has been talking about, um, when they were essentially recovered and, and everyone thought that they were probably ready to be extubated, except every time when their sedation was lightened, to quote Ronaldo Bolomo, they went bananas. So, you know, they were pulling lines out and doing all these things. So uh, the conventional approach to that was to just resedate them and then we'll give it a go the next day. And so we said, okay, so that's, that's the conventional approach. Let, let's see what happens if we add dexmedetomida into that package of intervention. So we're not going to change anything else that you're going to do. If you want to resedate them, you can resedate them. If you want to try them on an antipsychotic, do that. Um, but the, the only difference that will come with the trial is they'll either get dexmedetomidine in addition to their other sedatives, which you can titrate if you want, or they'll get placebo. So, so we didn't leave the placebo people with nothing. They got everything else. But did they get everything else, or did they get dex on top of that? And our question was a very pragmatic one, um, certainly you know, where I'm in Brisbane at the moment. Brisbane at that stage had run out of money and we didn't have it available in our ICU. It was too expensive. So the question was, should we have DEX available for such patients? And, and the answer to the question was very profoundly yes. So uh, if you got randomised into the dexmedetomidine group, uh, on average, um, you were extubated a day early, you had two days less with delirium. Um, were those patients... Uh, uh, maintained at, a, at a, low, a lighter level of sedation, which is essentially your question. No, not all of them were. Um, the dexmedetomidine patients were more interactive and, and they were able to, uh, they seemed to, to look lighter, um, but that wasn't the goal of the study. The, the, the protocolised, uh, the, the, the care wasn't protocolised, so um, they were just told to you know, treat the patients as, as they thought they should. Um, but we, you know, we think that the dexmedetomidine allowed them to be more interactive. Could you have achieved that with something else? I don't know the answer to that question. We didn't do that in the trial. Yeah. I see what you mean. Okay, so that's a good question. That's not something that our, our trial would answer. But having ha said that, I, I, I can't see why not. I can't see why not. That you would have them uh, sedated to the point that they're not dangerous and filled with antipsychotics to the point that you might be addressing the underlying problem and, and then let them breathe and wake up. Okay, so we, we'll try and get a microphone to you folks for your questions. There's a lady here, um, and I'll just, since we are recording, I'll just ask that she has a microphone delivered to her so that we can hear that. This is the lady in the third row here. 
Yeah, hello. I'm from Wollongong Hospital Intensive Care Unit. Um, I'm a CNS, uh, trying to introduce uh, the RAS and uh, chemo ICU actually five years ago. Um, and then, but the thing is, uh, um, it's really, really long journey. Uh, it's really hard initially uh, to introduce RAS in, but, um, but at the end, in the probably four or five years, we finally, uh, everyone know how to use it. And from this year, uh, from uh, February, uh, I tried to introduce use chem ICU to our unit to uh, detect delirium, which is also a big ask from my boss, from my nurse director, uh, nurse manager and the uh, uh, unit director. Um, and uh, we found that uh, there's few barriers to introduce uh, chem ICU in, in our unit. So after three months of education, and I introduce implement the chemo ICU at bedside. Um, we have a big poster at each bedside, and also I give them all the small card to each nurses, uh, each nurse. So um, I thought this would be uh, successful, but after the audit I did last two months, I uh, feel only 20 percent people using it. Uh, I really, really disappointed. Uh, so I try to uh, conclude what's the barriers of uh, using the chemo ICU detected delirium. And then the first barrier is uh, uh, we have to exclude a uh, neural patient for the, for the positive chemo ICU. And then, um, and also um, uh, there's very um, low rate of having positive chemo ICU since we moved our uh, unit from a um, small and enclosed uh, area environment to a big, very big space and with a window with, you know, a nice uh, environment. Um, and my also uh, ICU consultant also said the delirium is much, much less uh, occurred after we uh, moved the environment um, since last year. And also another thing is what are you going to do about it when we detect a chem ICU positive patient? Uh, is any change with our practice or our interventions? And I said from the literature review, I said that we need to do early mobilization. And this one of our senior, another thing has initiated this program. This project in our unit is very, is probably um, uh, about 80% successful. Um, and then that's probably also contribute our patients less delirium at this moment. So uh, from last two months, I uh, uh, did a survey for the positive chemo ICU. It's only probably five patients having the problem. Um, so it's, it's really, um, I try to do uh, like key studies, but uh, um, it's all to do with the, what's intervention after. So I come here this, so for this uh, interconference. I really would like to get something out from you, panels, how, how we're going to intervene uh, if we detect a delirium patient. Thank you, thank you. Uh, no, that's something that I struggle with, actually. So, I mean, well, first easy. off, that's one of the most comprehensive questions I've ever heard <laughs> asked in a, in a session like this. Congratulations, long road. I think that you're being really honest about what this is all about. And it's, it's just so refreshing to hear the honesty of that. This is not a pie in the sky situation. This is not a, oh, great, we think this should happen. Bam, next month we're good. Um, I call that the climbing Mount Everest delusion. And what you have to realize is that you don't make this change by saying that on your watch on April 1st, we're going to make this implementation go unit wide. That's not what happens. What happens is you, you, you do incremental changes over time and you have to use PDSA cycles, plan, do, study, act cycles. And these, um, th this is what we call in our large scale implementation program at 80 ICUs in the United States right now. There's probably a total of maybe three, 400 ICUs that are implementing this actively right now in different programs in the, in the United States. But this is a, um, what can you do by Tuesday? I want, to, I want you to kind of walk out that door with this in your head. What can you do by Tuesday? Because what that means is this, and the IHI came, in, came up with that, the largest quality improvement program in the United States. Instead of saying on April 1st, we're going to launch this unit wide and all of you nurses are going to do this and have this epic fail because it's too big, too much, too, too much to expect the culture to change like that. You, you instead say this, who are my two nurses that I think are totally into this, want to do it, want to want to uh, adopt this, and let me go to those two nurses. One's John, one's, one's Mary. John, Mary, who are your patients today? It's Monday. Okay, tomorrow on Tuesday, we're going to do our CAM assessment. We're going to try and early mobilize. We're going to do whatever on the ABCDF bundle we want to do on Tuesday with your patient. Just one person at a time or two people at a time. 
on that Tuesday. You do the event on Tuesday. You manage the patient the way you want. You see what went right, what went wrong. So, okay, tomorrow on Wednesday, we're doing this again with the same patients. We're going to fix what went wrong on Tuesday. We're going to fix what needs to be fixed. And on Wednesday, we'll do it better. And you go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You learn from it. Two things are happening. One is that you're working out kinks within your own unit because none of this is a one-shoe-fits-all. The second thing that happens is very interesting. Other people are watching you. And other nurses are like, wait a minute, that, that's really neat. Why didn't I get my patient? And so they want to be a part. So you go from one nurse to two, two nurses to three, and it grows over a period of time. You can't be, sad, you can't be expecting this to change quickly. Now, you said that uh, you, you've, you've been doing this and you've been changing other things like early mobilization, and you think that some of your low delirium may be because you're fixing the problem with mobility. I would also bet you that some of your low delirium is lack of compliance with the tool or saying that they're unable to assess when really they're delirious. So there's probably multiple things, and we'd have to go offline to figure all that out, but I just applaud you for what you're doing. I think it's, uh, it's important for you to acknowledge that you are in, heading in the right direction, but early, uh, early interventions that will grow over time is, is the way to go with this. And I, I'd love to talk with you more outside of this conference, perhaps outside there, and, and help you more with this, but I don't want to hog the microphone anymore on this answer. Just, just one quick addition. Applaud to your hospital for having a clinical nurse specialist. In my experience, the units that have the quickest adop adoption of these using the RAS or the SAS sedation assessment and uh, delirium assessment tools have clinical nurse specialists at the bedside who have the opportunity to teach the other nurses how to do that. So congratulations for that part. Thank you. So let's take some more questions. So there's a gentleman at the back, and then I'll come to Ian after uh, this. Thank you. And then I see a lady at the front. I'll come to you. Hi. Um, I'm Uriel from uh, Israel. So two questions. One short one. Regarding choice of sedatives, there is always the question, use longer ones that will win quickly, uh, slowly, or use the shorter ones so that you can make changes faster or certain. So what would be your take on that? And the other question is regarding the depth of sedation. I, I feel like we are sometimes getting into a chicken and an egg problem. So are we the, the most difficult patients need more sedation so they do worse? Or are we making them worse by sedating them more? And sometimes it's difficult to, to separate those two aspects. So I wanted to ask what, what is your take on the basic science of it all? So are we, why are, why are we getting worse patients with more sedation and the more complex are, we, are these cytokines? Hyperoxygenation, hypo, hypoxemia, is it metabolic, cardiovascular, the, change, the brain changes, the micro changes in the brain. So where are we on the basic science on why is this all happening? Thanks. Fantastic. That sounds like a perfect one for you, Yaya. <laughs> Moved it over. Th th thanks, Brian. It's very they pushed the you. microphone towards me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I think when it comes to the uh, choice of sedative agents, and I'll start with that first. Um, although the studies we've done and I presented showed no correlation between the choice of sedative agents and the different outcomes we looked at, uh, there is a lot of uh, meta analysis, a lot of randomized trials that really in a, a very high level of evidence suggests that the use of a non-benzodiazepine agents are better in terms of shorter time on the ventilation and perhaps a shorter time on ICU. So I think uh, at this stage, uh, uh, a non-benzodiazepine approach seems to be the one that's more prevalent. Uh, although we hope that through our study, uh, we will provide a, a firm answer to which combination and to which level. The one thing I want you to think about is not to think of the sedation agents in isolation. Think of the sedative agents in combination with the sedation level you achieve. So you, at this stage, I think the sedation levels seem to be more important than the sedative agents, although some agents may give you better ability to achieve the level of sedation you need. In terms of your second question about the chicken and egg exercise, uh, it is absolutely true that if you have a higher acuity of illness, your inflammation is significantly more and more severe, and the you know the neuroglial cells at the brain cells are more primed through that high level of inflammation to be activated, and when they are activated, they are at a much lower threshold 
to be injured by you know, additional things like deep sedation or some uh, other sedatives or agents that are being given. So the fact that you have a higher severity of illness puts you at a much higher risk of any additional damage that was called about the secondary in injury. And that's pretty much like a brain injured patient where they get a trauma in the, in the street and then they get a secondary insult by hypoxia. This is exactly the same situation where they have a higher inflammation from the severity of illness and they get a secondary insult by the depth of sedation. They may need deep sedation in the first 24 hours, first 48 hours, but the, the, the message is limit that deep sedation to the l shortest possible time that you need to keep them deeply sedated. Superb. So sh sh getting shorter time, so let's have Ian and uh, then this lady here, and I think we're out of time then. I, I've got two questions for you, Brian, and this is a slight change of subject. I was trying to duck questions. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the first one, you mentioned a number of times through your presentation that age was one of the det determinants of poor outcome. An increasingly common admission phone call I've got an 84-year-old. No, 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 it's a really good age. No, 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 I don't want 84-year-olds in the ICU, um, which we, we fail with mainly. Um, d despite your comment that age is one of the determinants, there's certainly at least single centre observational studies that say, in fact, the elderly do very well. So my yeah, question that's, number that's one. because you've done. That's because you've been gatekeeper, yeah. So um, it, that's, it yeah. always shows this. Over 80s do better in intensive care. You go, that's amazing. What is it about these wonderful people? The, the fact is, is that we've only let the wonderful people in, um, and the people who the people who had very high comorbidities and very high severity of illness don't get in the door. So your ICU outcomes look good, uh, but you've left them out the door. I personally believe, and I know this happens in the UK still to a reasonable extent. Uh, it's interesting to hear you saying it. I think the days of gatekeeping and denying ICU ICU admission have, have gone because age, severity of illness are predictors, but they're not nearly accurate enough. We do not have nearly the sensitivity and specificity to reject people. We should take them to intensive care, give them a trial of treatment, which I think lasts between three and four days probably, of multi-organ support, and then they will tell you if they are going to be survivors. Uh, they may be orange pausers or green goers, but uh, that's when you identify where the red stoppers are, and that's when you can say with a far higher certainty to a family, we've done everything appropriate, but it's now time to change our goals because your loved one has proven that they're not able to improve despite an optimal trial of ICU intervention. Is that not a very, very expensive and painful way of saying what you knew on day one? No. no. Okay. Yep. My, my second question to you, Brian, was to, to do with clinics, um, with, with the very disappointing results from practical and the, and the other studies. In, in, in my hospital, a couple of colleagues and I want to actually set up a clinic. Um, be very, very selective which patients we invite back, trying to just get the cohort that are most likely to benefit that are falling between the cracks. Are we wasting our time? Are we being Yeah, idiots? so I, don't get me wrong. You know, it's nice. I deliver, I deliver messages uh, with directness and sometimes more than I really mean. Uh, this, this is not abandoned hope. We have got a lot of sick people with a lot of problems, and some of it's due to critical illness, and some of it's due to the exposures we give them in intensive care. Um, uh, but not as much as we said, but still a lot of it. And some of it's just been about being hospitalised. That's still all important. And these people have fallen through the cracks before their critical illness because they've got low-level dementia that's undiagnosed. They've got untreated heart failure, etc. So actually, what we need to do is be the conductors of an orchestra to bring these specialists uh, along with us, along with good ICU nurses and doctors, etc., along with our physios working in a continuum of care. Uh, with the, but we need to be bringing in geriatricians and, and uh, geriopsychiatrists uh, and getting people who are really actually very good at this to actually piece together how much of this is comorbidity and can be treated or limited or modified and how much of it is acute morbidity, perhaps PICs that were related. So, so you shouldn't stop doing this, uh, but it's unfortunately it's wrong to believe that the many people who've tried to improve this have actually succeeded to date. That's just an answer, that just makes a cycle back in our iteration of uh, saying, okay, we still have more to know. And I think the phenotype uh, and then identifying phenotypes and then testing whether they'll benefit is the way. And I think it sounds like you're, you are trying to do that. But it's not, unfortunately, the green goers. They'll make you feel good because they'll do well, but not because of what you're doing to them, because they're going to do well. Brian, if I could just tag on to that. Your, your, um, your comments were, were very helpful earlier, but don't think that all those negative studies didn't have some reasons for their negativity, for example. If Vanderbilt, by the way, we have a post-ICU survivor's clinic, and the way that you say you're going to be selective, the way that we pick the patients is, 
uh, if they were on a ventilator or in shock, and if they had a day, two days or more of delirium. So we're trying to pick the highest rung of the ladder of who will need our post-ICU clinic. And we do have a geriatrician in that clinic, Brian, with us, and a pharmacist to help do, do medical reconciliation. Uh, but I wanted to make one quick comment, Brian, about your, your big table with all the negative studies, the couple of positive ones and the negatives. Uh, just to take one of the, of the categories of those studies that was on there, you said that the Schweikert study was a good and impressive, but it was small, it hasn't been reproduced, and then you showed M Morris and, and Moss. I would just point out right off the bat that if this is day zero and this is day 10, the Schweikert study was very, very early, and these two other negative studies, the Morris and the Moss study, were, were later and without one of them without any sedation protocol. So if you look into the studies past the conclusion of the abstract, there are reasons why these studies were negative. Don't just think, oh, one was positive, one was negative. They're not all built the same. For example, this Schaller study, which is, I think, a confirmatory study of Schweikert, in a sense, one was medical, one was surgical, that just came out in Lancet this month, instead of being at the first two days, it was at day three-ish, instead of day eight to 10, which is where the Moss study was. So the earlier you push this stuff, the more effect it has, seemingly. And that's exactly what Yaya was telling us. Okay. So what, are we out of? Yeah, we're out of time. Oh, well, this lady was wanting to ask a question. Oh, short question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, just a short question. One of the things that I struggle with sort of at the bedside is, um, you know, the scenario that with the patient with agitated delirium, the day team will try some olanzapine, the night team will try some haloperidol, the day team will try some mirtazapine, then we'll try cotiapine, then we'll try some melatonin, then we might restrain them, and then we'll need a sleeping tablet at night time. <laughs> is, there, is there any experience or evidence behind the development and implementation of a unilateral but medically and nursing supported single pharmacological approach to managing this problem? Just a short question. Huh? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Mike, Michael's excited by that question. No, I'm excited. Uh, well, it, it, it puts me in mind of a, of a really tiny study that's often misinterpreted, but I think is the answer to your question. So it's the, it's the Devlin study of quetiapin. And, and it's the, other than Dahlia, it's the only placebo-controlled trial showing the superiority of any inter pharmacological intervention for the treatment of established delirium. About a third of them were agitated. The other two-thirds were not agitated at, at time of entry. So you could look at that study and say, OK, quetiapin works, and we haven't got much evidence for any of the others, so we should just use quetiapin. That might or might not be true. But the, the, the more nuanced interpretation of that study is that if, if you got randomised to the quetiapin arm, you got regular quetiapin every 12 hours, regardless of what happened, until your delirium resolved. And if you got into the other arm, you got as required haloperidol, as required. And, and there's other studies that have shown atypical is not really much better than haloperidol. So what that study is probably telling us is that regular antipsychotics are better than as required antipsychotics. Now, do you choose quetiapin? Uh, Quetiapin is particularly sedating atypical antipsychotics. So if the patient's got a lot of agitation, that yes would be the answer to that. If, if they've got a hypoactive delirium, that would, from first principles anyway, no trials, but from first principles would say, yeah, maybe, maybe the less uh, sedating ones like risperidone or olanzapine might be better. But once you've chosen, just keep doing that. You might up dose, but do that. And then if you really need to do something on top of it to control you know, a really problematic period where the patient's thrashing around, you could choose between haloperidol, as, as, as they had the option in the Devlin trial, or, or you could do, if you really needed to, some transient sedation. But, but regular is better than PRN. Right. Well, we will stop at that. Sorry, were you going to have the final word? Oh, no, please, say, please do. I was going to just thank you as well, Brian, as well as the rest of the panel. So I don't really, um, regardless if you're in pain, agitated, or, in, or delirious right now, would you please join me and thank the panel for a fantastic discussion.